Uh, you all are very much welcome from wherever you are joining us today. My name is Pritam, a member of uh, World of Optometry Forum. And before we get started, it is very much important to keep some, uh, do some cover works, uh, some general housekeepings. So I would like to request everyone to please keep their cameras and mics off. This is just to eliminate uh, the breakdown noises, which can lead, uh, you know, which can cause some feedbacks and noise disturbances to the speaker as well as the other attendees. Also, please rename your devices uh, with the name that you registered with. This is the name that you will be receiving uh, your certificate of attendance. If your name on the devices does not match the name that you register for the webinar link, you will not get your certificates of attendance. So to receive your certificate of attendance, you will also be required uh, to stay for the duration of the webinar, after which we will send you a simple review form to fill out via mail. And please post your questions into the chat box features uh, towards the end of the um, uh, topic, as well as you can do this anytime during the presentation and they will be answered at the end of the uh, presentation by the guest speaker. Uh, also, please address your questions to everybody options uh, so that it is visible for everyone. And today's presentation will last uh, for around 35 to 45 minutes, followed by a question and answer sessions. And I'm very much delighted to present our guest speaker for today, who is Dr. Uh, Kathy Stern. To brief about her, Dr. Kathy is a behavioral developmental as well as a neurooptometrist near Boston in the USA. Her practice is devoted solely to vision therapy, myopia control, as well as vision rehabilitations. She is a current trustee and research director of the College of Syntonic Optometry and also leads the Neurooptometric Rehabilitation Association's clinical application of neurooptometric rehabilitation clinical skill course. She teaches at conferences and workshops primarily in the United States and Asia and is passionate about vision therapy, vision rehabilitation, optometric phototherapy, uh, sports vision, and the use of assistive technology. Dr. Stern believes the eyes and vision are the key players in prevention, enhancement, and rehabilitation for lifelong success. That's a, that's a good phrase, actually. And today, uh, we are very much fortunate to have her on board uh, with the topic of discussions of ocular motor testing and treatment. Therefore, uh, without any further ado, I pass you over to, the, to Dr. Kathy for the commencement of the session. Over to you, Dr. Kathy. Thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, good evening to all of you. It's morning for me. Um, and um, I'm going to set my timer here so I make sure I keep to my time. So today's topic was oculomotor testing and therapy. And what I did here was I created a small manual, just a beginning manual of some uh, testing and techniques that you will all get at the end of the presentation. And I'm just going to go through it so that you have an idea what's here, but also we'll be able to go away knowing more about some of the testing and therapy. Now, when we talk about eye movements, I think that they are incredibly important. They're not only important because they're kind of our radar to the world, but also they are important because they are the basis for many of the other techniques and testing that we do. And they are the basis for many of the other visual skills that we have and that we need to have. Now, when I'm talking oculomotor, I'm talking primarily about eye movements. But when you read the literature, you will find that sometimes they consider accommodation and even binocular vision as part of oculomotor because they can talk about one aspect of vision, which is how we take in the information. But in optometry, we tend to break it down because we understand the complexity of the different systems. Now, when we're talking about testing, 
we all know that you can pick up a pen or you can pick up a wand and you can have someone follow it. But that's not the same as what happens when we try to do any type of reading. Or it is not certainly the same as when we're moving around and also needing to move our eyes. So the test that I use the most is the developmental eye movement test. Now, it's normed for ages 6 to 13. There was developed but never really published an adult version where instead of having single numbers, they were double digits. But I will say this. If you do it with an adult, the vertical and the horizontal should be at least as fast as a 13-year-old. And the ratio between them should be about one to one. So the same speed with which they can do the vertical should be the same speed as the horizontal. And we can talk about that again once you're more familiar with the test. So the developmental eye movement test consists of three cards. And they're a little hard to see in the slides because when you get any type of slide, you'll find that they dull the numbers a little bit so people can't sort of steal the test but I do have the actual cards here and I will show you at least one of them. And you can tell me when it's clear enough to see because you can't see the whole card, but you can see the numbers are quite sharp and easy to read. And the card is kind of a plastic. So it's one, you can clean it and two, it's easy for someone to hold. And what you have is three cards. Tests A and test B are exactly the same, except for obviously the numbers are not the same, but they are two columns of vertical numbers. And on test C, you have a random arrangement of horizontal numbers. The way that the test is given to someone is really important because if you don't give a good instruction, you're going to get a result that may not be that reliable. But before I give you the instructions, let me just tell you that when you are doing the vertical numbers, when you are having someone read the vertical numbers, you are basically measuring something called rapid automatized naming. It's right here in the first paragraph, rapid automatized naming or RAN which was found to be one of the things to look at when you were looking for a, a specific reading disability or what is actually called a specific reading disability or some people say it's the same as what they call dyslexia. Because a lot of the literature around dyslexia talks about it being an issue with decoding words and understanding the sounds of words or phonics, but it turns out that there are some children, for example, that you will test and they may do well on those types of tests, but they have difficulty with the rapid automatized naming. <clears throat> and then when you are doing the numbers across, if you're familiar with the King to Vic test, this Test C is very similar to the last page of the King to Vic test. The numbers are line by line, but they're not nicely arranged. So it's a little more challenging to follow across each line. And what you do is this. You have, a, and I'm gonna say child here, but I do it with adults too, but I put child in the manual because I know that you're interested in how you're going to use many of these activities with children, although many of them I use with adults as well. But you hand someone the first card, test A, and you say to them, I want you to read, and I'm gonna move up here and show you the directions. You wanna to say to them, I'd like you to read the numbers on this page as quickly as you possibly can. And then I say to them, start here. And I point to the very first number at the left side, at the top left. And I usually say to them, and I run my finger down and I say, 
okay, I want you to read this column. And then when you get to the bottom of the column, I don't want you to stop. And I want you to come up to the top of the next column and also read all the way down. And I tell them that they can't use their fingers to point. They want to point with their eyes, is what I say. Um, the big thing is to remind them not to stop, because if you don't, they'll often stop at the end of the first column, and then they lose timing. And you have a stopwatch. And what you do is, as soon as they start to read, or as soon as you say begin, you start the stopwatch. And the reason I say uh, to sometimes start it when you say begin, or maybe a split second after that, is because there are some children, not very often, but there are some who have difficulty getting the language out in a way that it takes them time to say that first number. And I want to count that time as well. But primarily, I can usually say go. And by the time I've hit the, uh, the switch on the stopwatch, they're already saying the first number. And then when they complete it, as soon as they're done, I stop the stopwatch and I write down the time. And I will show you, I will go past here and just show you. This is the typical score sheet that comes with it. And so you can follow along with them as they're reading the numbers. And you can, uh, if they miss a number or they skip a number, you can certainly mark that. I'll show you that a little bit later. And you mark the time down that it takes them to do test A. Then you do the same thing with test B. You put it in front of the patient. You can tell them they did a great job on test A if you feel that's appropriate. Some children know if they didn't do a great job, but I usually tell them that was a great effort. And now I want you to do the same thing on this page and just remind them not to stop at the bottom of the first column. And I do the same thing. I start the stopwatch and then I stop it when they read the last number. Now, when I put page C here in front of someone, I will tell you that they all begin to get a little nervous because it doesn't look easy. Even adults don't like it when you show it to them. But I tell them, don't worry about it. This is a little different, but all I'm asking is that you do the best you can with it. And I tell them they're gonna read the numbers again as fast as they can, but this time they're going to read across the lines like they're reading in a book. And what I do is I usually have the card in front of them and I point with my finger across at least two of the lines just to show them what I mean by reading across. And also to let them know that they're going to read all the way across because sometimes because the end column and the first column look very much like test A or B, they sometimes think they don't need to read that. They think it comes from the other test. Now, the one thing uh, about this is, or two things I should say that I'm going to tell you, is one, they are the same numbers on the test A and B are the same numbers in the same order on test C. So you are comparing the same type of reading in the sense that if someone takes longer to say a particular number or they're not as familiar with, let's say some of the higher numbers, you're going to get an equal comparison. That's important. Now, when you are going across here, what you will do is, at least this is what I do, is if they miss the number, I circle it. If they skip a whole line, I circle the whole line. If they say a number that's different, I'll put a line through it and write right next to it very quickly the number they say. If they add a number, and adding a number can not mean that they come up with a number that isn't there. Usually what happens is, let's say they're reading the top line and it says three, seven, five, nine, eight. 
And they may get to the nine and not be sure they said it. So they may say three, seven, five, nine, nine, eight. And I add just between the nine and the eight on the score sheet, I add another number nine so that I know they added in a number. This becomes important when you go to score the test. <clears throat> now, if you look at this score sheet, when the test was originally done, they have something they call an adjusted time. An adjusted time means that if there are 80 numbers and I read 80 numbers, that's fine. But if I skip any numbers, for example, and I read it in the same amount of time that you do, we're not talking equal score because I've only read 79 numbers and you read 80 numbers. If I add a number, it's not a good comparison because you've read 80 numbers and I've read 81 numbers in the same amount of time. So there is a formula here for adjusting the score, which is you take 80 over 80 minus the omissions plus the additions. And when you do that, you will get an adjusted time. When the test was first developed, they had you adjust the time for both the vertical and the horizontal. But because errors are often very few, if not any, on the vertical, in the newer scoring, they do not adjust the time for the vertical. But what they say is if someone makes more than five errors on the vertical, you don't even do test C. What I do is I've calculated it. If they make one or two errors on the vertical, it makes absolutely no difference, particularly to the scoring. But if for any reason they make more than that, I often will do an adjusted time uh, on my own because now what they have for the scoring is instead of doing it yourself, there's a little computer program that comes with it that uh, you just plug in the numbers and there's no room to put uh, errors for uh, test A and test B in terms of the calculation. So I'll calculate it, but I have to tell you, my general experience has been that if someone is reading the vertical columns, this is not part of the test, this is just an observation of mine, because I've done it many, many times, is that if they miss more than one number going vertically, that generally they have some type of reading disability. That doesn't mean vision therapy can't be helpful, but we need to be aware that they may also need some type of educational intervention to help them with reading. Now, when you'd go across, it's very common to have some errors, especially in children. And in fact, some errors are expected at certain ages because they're not uh, fully ready to, to do this as well as, an, let's say, an older child. And what you do is you adjust the time by considering just the omissions and additions, because obviously they're going to change the exact time. And then you get an adjusted time score. Now, aside from the adjusted time score, you do wanna know how many errors they make. Generally, they look just at the errors again in the uh, horizontal numbers. But when you are doing that, you also count any substitutions. So for example, if someone is reading across and they say a different number than the one that is there um, and any transpositions. So for example, if it says nine two and they read two nine, uh, you would want to count that as an error as well. That doesn't count, obviously, for the adjusted time because they're still reading the same number of numbers, but it does count for the error score. 
Now, I know this is a lot of information and it sounds a little confusing, but if you actually do the test, and what I do when I learn anything new is I tend to do it pretty much on every patient that I see, whether it's something I need to do with them or not, just to get familiar with the mechanics of it, with what I'm going to say, so that when I do need the information, I'm much more familiar with it. So when you go to do the scoring, you need to get what's called a ratio here. And what you do is you have a horizontal adjusted time. If they didn't make any errors, that adjusted time is obviously the same as the actual time. And then you divide it by the vertical time. On this score sheet that originally came with the test, they talk about a vertical adjusted time. But again, we said generally you don't do that. So you calculate this ratio. And then there is either a booklet, which came with it originally, or now they have this computer program, which will give you the ratio and it will tell you what percentile it falls into. If it's a very high percentile, like the 80th or 90th percentile, that will happen when their, score, their time is, let's say, slow on the vertical, which then also makes their time slow on the horizontal, because if they can't read numbers rapidly, they're not going to read them more rapidly in one direction than the other. If the percentile is low, let's say the 20th percentile or the 15th percentile, then generally, because of the way the ratio is calculated, that means that they had more difficulty or were slower on the horizontal. And that tends to mean that it's more of an oculomotor issue, not as much related to a reading disability, but I do find that even when the percentile is high and we know it's more of a rapid naming issue, that working on oculomotor skill can still be very helpful, but they will also generally need some type of reading support, maybe a specialized reading program. The percentiles that you get are based on either the child's age or their grade level. So I tend to use the child's age, but if, for example, they were held back or they started school at a slightly older age for some reason, I will also look at the grade level. Because if I have an eight-year-old who's only in first grade, they may not yet be at the level of an eight-year-old because they haven't had the same experiences in terms of oculomotor use. So I will often compare the two, but generally I go by age. Now, if a child has just turned, for example, eight, I will also look at the scoring for age seven because they don't have a breakdown by even six months. So some testing that you do, you'll notice that if it's eight years and three months, it's a different scoring than let's say eight years and 11 months. This does not have that. So if they've just turned that age, I will often look at what it should be before that because there are a couple of places where the difference is quite big between one age and another. Obviously, as they get older, that becomes less different. But at the early ages, there's quite a step up between some of the ages. So as I said here, if they may have an expressive language, meaning getting those words out, or processing speed delay based on the vertical score, um, that will mean likely that there is something more than just a visual issue. But if you want to look at saccadic eye movements, you cannot base it just on test C alone. You need to use the ratio score or the error score. 
Now we didn't talk about the error score. When you get an error score, there is also a percentile based on age for the errors. At a young age, it may be okay if they make a number of errors, but as a child gets older, or certainly in an adult, by the time they're 11, 12, 13, there should be one or less errors. Now, I know that was a lot. I don't know if there are questions on it, but I will come back to that because it's important and because it can be confusing, but I think it's an excellent, excellent test and I use it a lot because it gives me information that compares how they just read numbers vertically where there's minimal eye movement involved versus or certainly horizontal eye movement versus what happens when they have to read across. Now you'll notice on the score sheet, the numbers are arranged very nicely, but clearly they're not on the actual test. And I know that it's important to do this, even when maybe it's not so important to the uh, patient you're seeing, because it's a little hard sometimes in the beginning to follow the numbers and mark them and still continue to listen to the patient. I mean, right now I can probably do the vertical without even looking at the paper and know how they did because I've heard it so many times. But in the beginning, that's not the case. And every once in a while, you will get a child uh, who goes to do the horizontal and they are all over the place. They are saying numbers you can't even figure out where they are. They skip a line and then they say numbers who knows from where they come because they're in the middle of the chart somewhere. So sometimes I even have to write what they're saying on the side here and then try to figure out were they going up and down between lines? Were they just saying numbers because they couldn't find their place? Uh, it's a little hard to know. The other is that once in a while, a child will start to read the horizontal down because they've just done vertical and I do stop them and start them again. I don't consider that, oh, they can't do the horizontal. They're just, they just haven't quite caught on to the second set of direction. Now, I don't do the Ensuco or what is sometimes called the Maples testing, but I do know that uh, a lot of people use it. And the importance of it is this. If you look at the basic Ensuco test, you will find that there is the ability to do it. Let's say you're looking here at level five and a person can follow the small wand you're holding, uh, like a wolf wand that has a little ball on the end, and they can do rotations clockwise, counterclockwise. That would lead you to believe that it's a good ability. And many oculomotor tests look at just ability, but they have found that that's the least reliable aspect of grading eye movements. That it's much more important to look at their head and body movement and even their accuracy. But the head and body movement piece is very important because if someone is doing it, but they're moving their head while they're doing it, or I have a lot of children, you'll see them move their mouth while they do it. They actually are following around with their mouth like this. Um, or they stick their tongue out, or they're trying to use some aspect of their motor system to kind of prop up the oculomotor, that's going to be a very important observation because that person certainly doesn't have very automatic eye movements that they should have. So the, the nice thing about this is that you can look at how they do the pursuits and saccades but also take a look at how accurate they are. And more importantly, is there any head or body movement? Because that there should be none, for example, or very little if there are four or five, but you'll sometimes see even at level one that someone can do one or two cycles, but they have huge body and head movement while they're doing it. 
So it doesn't always fall nicely across the table like it looks here. And so you do have to sometimes make a bit of a judgment. But I think that that's an important piece if you have nothing else that you can do because you don't have the actual uh, cards, for example, of the developmental eye movement test. So when you have this booklet, you'll see that there are standards here that are one standard deviation below average. I know that for the developmental eye movement test, I don't know if they still do it, but I think they do. They have a sort of screening score, which is one standard deviation. And then they have a more clinical score that's half a standard deviation. Um, and in part, that's because Dr. Richmond, who is the developer of the test, is someone who actually practices near me. And when he was developing this or, or putting out new scoring, I said to him, you know, one standard deviation to me is too much. If a child is considered passing and their one standard deviation below, they're probably still going to be struggling. I'd really like to have a scoring that's half a standard deviation. So I don't know if he was already planning to do that or if I influenced him in any way, but it's nice to have that. So this is a pretty broad test if you're within one standard deviation. But again, it's still useful. You never make a diagnosis. You never decide what you're going to do based on one test. You have the history. You have all the testing that you do. And you try to come up with both a diagnosis, but more importantly, a plan to help that child or adult. So what I thought was really important here for the second part was to go through some activities that you can do and that I use all the time with most patients in terms of having something that works on eye movement. But what I've learned is that it's important to think about what you're emphasizing, like eye movements, with utilizing other systems. So we'll talk about that as we go through. Uh, the one thing to know is that if they're doing eye movements, larger saccadic movements, for example, are generally easier than smaller saccades. So if someone is having difficulty, you may have to start with a technique that involves larger eye movements or do it at a level that involves larger eye movements because the smaller, more discriminating eye movements are more challenging. So I hope all of you know that a Marsden ball is just a ball hanging on a string. In many cases, it has letters written on it, but we can use it even without letters. And one of the ones that I do a lot is this. Although it does say here, uh, at some point, I did put in a comment in the manual that says, you know, you really want to do most of the eye movement activities standing. There are times when someone cannot start that way. They can't control their body. They can't control their eyes. So we want to start them lying down on the floor. But I want to add in a timing piece because moving the eyes has timing to it. Being in the right place when you want to look somewhere is important. So we do what we call snow angels. Now, I know for many of you, you've probably never even seen snow. But the reason we call it that is here, and I don't remember doing these as a child, but apparently there's an activity where children lie down in the snow and they move their arms and legs inward and outward. So they would start with their arms and legs next to them, on their arms on their side and their legs together. And then they open their legs and raise their arms up. And when you get done, you get this pattern in the snow, uh, including a little head when they pick their head up, that looks very similar to uh, like an, a doll that looks like a, they call an angel. So what you have someone do is lie down under the Marsden ball so that it is above their chin. 
And in fact, the way I do it is I ask someone to lie down and to put their body so that if the ball could fall on them, because it's generally about 20 centimeters above them, I say, I want you to put your body in a way that that ball, if I were to drop it all the way down, would hit your chin. And you'd be surprised how many children, it's up in front of their forehead, it's over the middle of their body. They don't even know where their body is spatially. So it's important to give them an opportunity to learn that at the same time. And then what I do is I take the ball and I gently push it along their midline toward their toes. Now the ball, because it's on a string and it only can go so far, generally stops maybe right at the uh, top of the legs where the legs begin to split. And when it's there, I tell them that's where I want their arms and legs completely together. And then I slowly move the ball back up to just above their head. And I show them that what I want them to do is as the ball moves from toward their toes to above their head, that I want them to go from together to apart. And exactly when the ball is at the bottom of the uh, path, they should be together. And exactly when it's at the top of the path, they should be apart. And it's not together apart, together apart when they see it at the top. They have to time it so that it matches the flow of the ball. And what I do is I then hold the ball there, I let it go, and it starts to move quickly. But within less than a minute, it starts to slow down. And they have to keep changing the speed of their arm and leg movements to match the ball. And you'd be surprised how often that doesn't happen. Sometimes they notice, often they do not. And so if they don't, what I'll do is, as the ball comes, let's say above their head, I'll grab it and stop it. And all of a sudden, they might be all together when they're supposed to be apart. And I'll say to them, is that where you're supposed to be when the ball is in that position? And they'll say no. And I say, well, let's see if you can time it to the ball. And maybe I'll even take the ball and slowly go down toward their toes and up toward their head a few times and have them move their arms and legs. So again, they get the idea of what they're supposed to do. And then I try it again. And sometimes it takes even a week or two of practicing this for some children to be able to put that movement and moving the eyes, following the ball together. But it's a very good activity and easy to describe, easy to have them do at home. Uh, if they don't have a ball they can tie up at home, they can just take some cloth or uh, here we have socks because it gets cold but I have them just make a, a small wad of something and just tie it in a way to a doorway or the ceiling and have it so that it can go back and forth. Now, there's another one with the Marsden ball that I like a lot, and it's called Three Ways to Catch. And what I do is I hold the ball and the child is standing across from me. Now, the first thing I say to them when they're standing across from me is, are you standing in a position where if I let go of this ball, you'll be able to catch it? And often they'll say yes, and they're like many feet across the room away from me, and I let the ball go, and clearly it doesn't even come close to them. So they have to judge that space. Once they're in the correct position, I teach them that there are three ways to catch the ball. One is with their fingertips. So I want their fingertips touching the ball, not the inside of their hand, just their fingertips. Then we have one that's called palms. And I usually have them hold their hands sideways and the palm is the middle here. So I have them just grab the ball. So they really have to time it very accurately because that ball is moving. And if you don't grab it at just the right moment, it's going to end up on your fingers or it's going to end up on your wrist. So they have to be very accurate in catching it right at that moment. 
And the last one is fists. And what I have them do is close their hands and kind of put their thumb up against the edge. And then I want them to catch it across their fingers. I don't want them to catch it on the base of their hand, on the heel of the hand. I don't want to catch it way at the top. I want to catch it right across the fingers. So again, they're holding them sideways. That ball comes toward them and they have to be very accurate. Because the ball is round, if they are not right at the middle of the ball, if they're just a little bit forward or back from the center, the ball usually pops right out of their hand. So um, what I do is each time I let go of the ball, I might say fingers, I might say palms, I might say fists. One of the things you'll notice is sometimes children are trying to anticipate you, so they already have their hands in a certain position. If they're standing there with their hands kind of like this to do fists, I will not call fists. I will always call something else so that they have to be ready to look and to follow and to hear and to translate that into action. The second way is called look and catch. It's the same activity, except the first time the ball comes toward them, they do not catch it and I do not say anything. I may ask them uh, to read a letter or number that's on it as it gets close to them. Now they should not be reading the number as it's coming toward them. They should wait until it's right in front of them. So again, there's a timing to that seeing and saying. And then the second time I will call off one of the ways to catch the ball. And the next one, they have to remember to say the letter or the number that's on the ball that they see, and the next time I call a way to catch. Now, when you're doing that, you cannot see the same numbers and letters that they are seeing. I don't really care. If I see that their eyes are looking toward that ball and they are making an effort to say one of the letters or numbers that's likely on that side of the ball that I cannot see, I'm fine with that. So now we're just gonna move on to thumb circles. And what I tell everyone is you have the equipment attached to you. You take your thumb and you hold it upward. And what you do is you start along midline and one eye will be covered. Now, if you find that when they use their own hand to cover their eye, you can use a patch if, if it tends to make them hold their head funny. But what I like to do, and I'm going to show you from the side here, is I don't want the eye fully covered. I usually angle the hand so that some light is still getting into that eye. Because if not, while you're doing the activity, what happens is both eyes are still trying to work together. And if this eye is fully covered, they're going to get this blackness that jumps in and out. So I always try to do it so that there is something uh, with some light. If they're having trouble holding their hand up, I will usually take a spoon that has kind of a long handle on it and I will have them hold the spoon, which they can then put against their eye and then angle it just slightly. And that seems to work. The only thing you have to watch is anything they're holding up, make sure that it's angled a little bit, like aligned with the side of the nose, because if not, they may have a little area up in the top corner where they can still see, and that'll be very confusing to them. So your thumb is in front of you along midline. I ask them to not move their head if they can, or, or certainly I want them to follow with just their eyes. And I tell them for this one, they are going to look directly at their thumb. Sometimes for some young children, I'll even put a little sticker on their hand so that they have something to look at. I don't want them, I, I, it's different than knowing your thumb is there peripherally. And they wanna be looking at it, following it up as high as they can go without bringing their head up and then go around to the side. You don't have to go out very far, but certainly past the body. I don't know, can you see me okay when doing this? Cause I only get part of me in the, on the screen. They come out past the body, down about waist level, and across to the middle. 
And I have them do 10 of those in one direction generally, and then 10 of those in the opposite direction. And while you think that switching directions shouldn't make a difference, I have seen that it does make a difference. So I asked them to go both ways, and then I asked them to switch and do the same thing on the other side. And sometimes they will have often, in fact, they may have difficulty on one side than the other. If I'm then going to send it home, I will ask them to first do the side that's more challenging, then do the other side, and then come back and do at least five in each direction, 10 if they can, on the side that needs a little bit more work. <clears throat> now, coin circles is similar in that you will hold a small coin in your hand. I've taken kind of a little black circle here so it's easier for you to see it when I'm holding it. It says here a quarter. In the US, we have a, a coin that's a quarter that's, um, I don't know exactly how far across, but it's large enough, maybe even a little larger than what I'm holding here, so that if you're holding it between your fingers, you can still see most of the coin. If you don't have that, you could take anything that's round or easy to hold and look at, as long as they can see part of it above their fingers. And what I have them do is hold it and they uh, want to hold it so that it is facing them. And the first way is doing what we call the racetrack. So think of a racetrack that a car might be going around. And so what you're doing is you're starting close to the eye, as close as you can, looking at what's on there. You want some picture or some text or something for them to be able to see on it. And you have them go out to the side, following it with their eye, out in front of them and back to the middle. Obviously they can't go too far over because their hand or the blockage here will be a problem. So you have them come in, go out to the side, come back around and come in again. And we say it's like a car going around a racetrack. Then I wanna do it vertically and we call that a Ferris wheel. A Ferris wheel is one of those uh, devices you might see uh, at a fair or uh, sometimes in some resort type places where people sit in it and it actually goes around in a more vertical direction. And so we say, you know, a Ferris wheel because a lot of kids know it from having been to a carnival or somewhere where they've seen it. And what we have them do again is go up as high as they can without uh, moving the head. And sometimes they want to kind of go forward because they're going to be making this sort of circle outward. I'm going to put my elbow off to the side so you can see this more. They're going to be going outward. And so they tend to kind of cut off early. And I say, no, I want you to go straight up as high as you can and then come around in that, in that circle. You want to go as high as you can and then come around, not start cutting off like maybe where your eye is. And that's very common that they don't go all the way up. <clears throat> now, it says to do three circles and then change direction, meaning if you're going this way, you then go the other way. Um, I will get them up to doing even 10, but I will start with just a few till they get the uh, hang of doing the activity. And the same thing in the vertical direction. And then you can also do what we call a figure eight, which is kind of a combination in that we can have them do horizontal and a figure eight would be thinking of the number eight as if it's flat on the ground and you are following the path of that eight. So you're starting near you, going out along midline, coming back towards you, going out to the other side and coming back. So think of that like the eight lying down here in front of you and you're following 
that eight. Then when we do it vertically, I say to them, think of that number eight that was lying down. Now it's going to stand up so that one side of the eight is near you and the other side of the eight is away from you so that you are following the top half of it coming in and following the bottom half. You're following the top half and then the bottom half. And of course you do this with each eye. And I wanna to try to get through the last few very quickly so you have time for questions. <clears throat> so column jumping is if you have a 10 by 10 heart chart, which many of you are familiar with, and this one doesn't have any numbering on it, Sometimes I will number some of the columns just to start to make it a little easier for someone. But what they're doing is this. This is a 10 by 10 grouping of numbers. So the first column on the left is number one. The next one is number two, all the way over to the end column, which is number 10. So if I tell them to start with one and 10, on this chart, they would be reading U, E, Y, X, E, O, Z, K, A, C. I think you can follow that. And then what I have them do is sometimes I can call off random columns, but generally so that they can find a way to easily do it at home also, I will have them do one in 10. And then I have them start with column two, and jump to column nine. So here it would be F, H, B, R, and then they do three and eight, and then they do four and seven. I don't have them do the two middle columns. They're usually quite easy to do. They're next to each other. And then once they've done four and seven, I may have them do three and eight again, and then uh, nine and two, and 10 and one. And what I generally will do for home, because some children can kind of memorize the letters, is I have a number of different uh, 10 by 10 charts that I've made up just by putting letters in a spreadsheet. And uh, so I'll give them a few of them to, to take home. The other thing would be to add a metronome. I usually put it at 60 beats per minute. And interestingly, sometimes that's slower than their normal pace. But you'd be surprised at how many times someone can do it quickly, more easily than they can time it and do it more slowly. And then what I do is I take the uh, heart chart and I cut it up into four pieces. So you're going to have four five by five charts. And what you do is you put them across from each other. So I will have two of them across at the top, and then I have two across from each other lower down. You don't put a card up like this card, that's just an illustration to show you four sets, but you would separate them. And it says that here, about 30 to 45 centimeters horizontally and about 30 centimeters vertically. Obviously, if it's a very small child, you might have to put it a little closer together. And in terms of the height of it off the floor, I generally put it so that the two top charts, uh, probably the middle of it is just a little bit higher or maybe even the bottom is sort of just above their eyes. So they can look up a little bit, but not a lot. And then I have the separation to the lower ones. And the idea is that they would read the first letter on each chart and then the second and the third. So it would look like this on those four charts. It would be V, F, O, N, and then S, N, E, C. Now, if you want, you can change that. I do that because that's like reading. But sometimes I might have want someone do the top left and then the bottom left and then the top right and the bottom right, uh, especially if I think they're memorizing the letters. I could have them... Uh, start anywhere and change it, but mostly I have them go top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right, 
but I do change the order around occasionally. Or if someone is getting very good at it, I might do it just to see if going in a different way challenges them or if they're part of some sport or something where eye movements are a little different than reading, then I want to mimic that. The arrow chart is just that. It's a chart with a bunch of arrows on it. And you can make them large, like this is a little bit larger. You can make them smaller. You can, uh, sometimes I make small ones, I put in a little circle. Um, I've done some other variations, but primarily what you're doing is this. On that top line, you have arrows that are pointing down, right, down, down, left, up. And what I want them to do is put their hands in front of them and with their palms facing the direction, I want them to say down. And then when they're saying right, I want the right hand on top and the left hand on the bottom, both palms facing to the right and they say right. And then they would say down, down, left. And when they say up, I want their palms up. What I find is that when they go to the side, they often wanna put the other hand in, uh, on top or they can't get their palms quite faced correctly. But once we get them doing that, that's what they want to be able to do. I then, when they can go through the chart at level one, just by itself, I will add a metronome and they have to do it to the beat of the metronome. For level two, you want to say the opposite. So if you're doing that top line, you'd be going up, left, up, up, right, down. That is not so challenging. What becomes challenging is levels three and four, and you can do three and then four or four and then three, it doesn't matter. But what you're doing is for example, in level three, you would move your hands down, but you would say up. And then you would move your hands right, but you would say left. I like to do level three before level four, which is the opposite of that, where you say the direction of the arrow, but you uh, move the, your hands uh, in the opposite direction of the arrow, because I find the visual of looking at it seems to be easier to match than matching the verbal. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing. And then uh, we are where I would say to be continued. And there's my email. And these are just a few activities to get started with. But I have to tell you, I use these activities all the time. I keep a, a folder of heart charts and arrow charts that I've uh, copied onto paper uh, that I can hand out for them to use at home. Today, if it's any easier, sometimes we'll send it in an email and they can print it out at home. But these are really the sort of foundational activities that I use all the time. So I think that we have uh, five minutes or so for questions. And what I'm gonna do is stop the share so that I can see the chat. I see there's maybe five questions there. So let me pop up the chat. Okay, so uh, how far away from the chart should they be? Uh, I don't know which activity we're talking about, but if we're talking about the arrows, uh, I have them standing maybe a meter away, maybe even a little bit closer. I, it's done at what I'd consider a near distance. Uh, you can do it from across the room if you want to, to do that. But generally I have other activities that I've, I'm doing at a longer distance. So I generally have them do it close. If we're doing the column jumping, the jumping across the letters, I also do that close. But sometimes, again, because children in school or adults in the real world or in the real world in general, we have to do eye movements to find things that are not close to us, I will uh, do that sometimes from across the room as well. I wouldn't say I do it all the time, but 
If I think they can handle it and I think it's important, I will do that. In terms of some yeah, of the other me, Dr. Kathy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The question was regarding the developmental eye movement tests. I mean, the the attendee want to ask like at what distance the test has to be performed. Okay, so we usually talk about the Harmon distance, which is the distance from the elbow to the middle knuckle. You want them holding it the same place they should be holding a book when they're reading. Now, if they tend to hold it very close or very far, I may let them do that, but I will mark that down. Um, or I may let them do the first one that way, but then I'll move it for the second one. Okay, the next question is, the is the term circle uh, activity being performed monocularly or it's being performed binocularly? It's, it's monocular. You're going to block one side, let some light in, and you're going to be doing one side and then you're gonna switch and you're gonna do the other side. Again, if they're having difficulty, let's say with the second side, when they go home to do it, or you're working with them the next time, have them start with that side, do the easier side, and then come back and try to do a little bit more with the side that's more challenging for them. Okay. What about the common signs that is being seen in dyslexic patients that we can you know, easily differentiate between the ocular motor anomalies as well? Well, I think that it's hard to separate out sometimes because we are using eye movements, but less so for the vertical. So if they're reading vertical numbers and they're struggling and they're missing numbers or their time is very slow, then I know there's gonna be an impact on the oculomotor. And in fact, children get referred because Someone says, I think they have a tracking problem. Well, it turns out that if you have slow, rapid, automatized naming, you also have difficulty following across line by line and keeping your place. It's part of the overall reading disability, but I do think that there can be a visual component because also a child like that may be uh, anxious. Uh, they know they're not doing as well as others. Now their visual field gets more compressed from the stress and that may be part of it as well. But what I will say is that initially, if you have someone with that as an accommodation to help them, you may find that just by taking that text and either isolating a line or creating space between the lines, they did a study that most text, when it's written, the spacing between the lines is about equal to the point size of the print. So if you are using word processing and you have 12 point type, the spacing will be automatically set in the program to be maybe 12.1. If I go in and I set it so that spacing is one and a half, 1.5 times the point size. So if I have 12 point type and I, I now make 18 point spacing, then often they can read better. And I think there was another question right before that one. Yeah, the success rate of the exercises. Yeah, I missed that. So how many do I give them? Well, it depends on what they can do. Usually I'm doing not just oculomotor activities, but in the office, I may be doing three or four activities in one day, depending on how long they can do each activity. If it's, for example, if I'm adding in accommodation and I'm having them use flippers, I may be spending you know, five to 10 minutes just doing that so then I can only do maybe two other activities. If it's something that takes less time, I may do four activities, usually not more than four. And when I send it home, I may only be sending one, possibly two of these oculomotor activities because generally I'm sending other things as well. And I'll send usually three, occasionally four things for them to do at home but usually no more than three and sometimes only two because that's all they can handle. Also, if they cannot do it 
as long as the goal. So let's say the goal is for them to go 10 times around with their thumb and they can only do twice before they get tired or they can't seem to do it. Although I do find their arm gets tired before their eyes get tired very often. Um, and we try to get them to build that up a little bit. But um, what I will do is I'll say, you know what? That's no problem. The goal is 10 times. I didn't expect you to be able to do that when we first started. But instead of just doing it once a day at home, maybe you could do it three different times in the day so that you get a little more practice. So you're getting the same 10 times, but you're doing it a few times in the day until they can do more at each setting. And how do we actually distinguish across the examination due to neurosensory or other causes? Well, when you have someone with poor eye movements, you're going to have a history. If they've had a brain injury, you know there's been a brain injury. That doesn't mean you don't want to work on it. It just means that potentially your expectation can be different. But I don't try to tell anyone at the beginning what it's going to look like when we're done with the activities, because I will have to eat my words many times if I do that, because some patients go more quickly than you expect, some do much better than you expect, and some don't do as well as you expect. So I try to suggest that we just have goals and we will continue to work both the goals as well as the level of the activities until we reach a place where it just seems like they're not going to get past that point, at least at that moment in time. Sometimes then I will take a break, maybe have them go home and not do the activities or just do them a few days a week. And then sometimes when they come back, they can now reach another level. Not always, but sometimes. So you have to, you kind of have to get a feel for it. There's no absolute rule. You know, as I like to say, uh, when students always ask me about brain injury patients, you know, what do you do with them? I say, if you've seen one brain injury patient, you've seen one brain injury patient. They're all different. And they will all be different even when you think they have more common kinds of issues in that how quickly they will be able to do them, how fast it will change, is different not only for each one, but even during the therapy. They may start to go very quickly through a number of activities and then it kind of plateaus. They may go very, very, very slowly and then all of a sudden they take off. So I don't have a way of predicting that. I, I always tell uh, patients that if I could go in and examine every nerve cell in their brain, I could maybe tell them more but I'm not able to do that. And the day that I can do that, the Nobel Prize Committee will call me and they don't know my telephone number. And then they laugh. So be careful what you promise. That's what I would say. Because if you promise that it will be, I mean, I will say that it appears that they can do better. It appears that it will be helpful. Um, but I never say it absolutely will be because I'll be in trouble. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, one last question from my side, actually. Uh, so I've been seeing patients with uh, brain injury and some of them actually present with accommodation versions as well as eye movement uh, dysfunctions. Like the parameters are not within the normal limit. So right. uh, in, yeah, in order to uh, you know, improve the parameters, improve the uh, symptoms, how do we actually train, uh, give them the visual training? Actually, do we need to correct the accommodation first, then versions, then uh, the right. eye movement, so, or simultaneously we can go with it? So the first thing would be, um, because the accommodation can be limiting, especially when they're doing things close to them, if I can prescribe low plus lenses, not only will that help the accommodation, but it often seems to open the field more. Um, I will do syntonic phototherapy with some of those patients to try to open the field. If I can't do that, I will often use things like prism flips on one eye uh, or something that I feel brings a sense of movement to the body. I may take yoke prisms of 15, 10, 15, 20, usually 10 to 15, and have them put them on up, 
down, you know, left, right. I usually do left and right. And then I do up and I usually end with down and I have them walking with that and what they can feel in their body, what they notice around them so that I'm getting them more in tune with their body and the real world. And then I will do a lot of oculomotor work. You can never do, in my opinion, too much oculomotor work. It's such a basis for everything that we do. In terms of the accommodation, I may try to work on that if they're age 35 or less. If they're over 35, they're headed toward presbyopia, so I don't push it very much. Um, and I um, sometimes I'll do plus plus flipping with them. Uh, just again, for some of the size changes, some of the uh, feeling changes. And then uh, I begin with very simple binocular techniques, more peripheral than central, because they're already very focally bound. They're already often constricted because of stress and because of the injury. And so everything I want to do is in bigger space. And then I'll move toward things like much later, maybe a Brock string. I may bring vectograms in even before a Brock string if they can do it, because again, I can get some of that peripheral uh, awareness. But just remember, my rule of thumb is if I think in an average patient, it's going to take 10 visits to get to a certain point, I generally double that for my brain injury patients. I, it, it is a slow course. It can be frustrating, but if they can keep with it, it, it does work. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kathy, for the valuable information. Thank you, guys. Uh, Anything else? I know we went a little over the time, um, but I'm always happy to be helpful. No, and no I think this manual up. is a start, and we could add to that maybe over time. Exactly. So, indeed, it was a very informative session, actually, and it has also given us a lot of uh, wonderful insights that we can take away today. So, uh, the question and answer sessions have, uh, we can end up with the question and answer sessions. And thank you once again, Dr. Kepi, for answering those questions. And, and thank you very much. Yeah. So if you have any other further questions we would like you to be answered uh, by Dr. Kepi, then you can just e uh, email uh, her directly with the email address that is... Um, it's spelled uh, out. It's P-O-C-T-O-R-S-T-E-R-N. You spell yeah. the word doctor out. Yep. Up oh, one R. One R. You have two R's in the middle there. Thank yep, you so much for helping it. out again. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you Have so much evening. for your attendance today. Yeah. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll also notify you with the next webinar day. And now I'm going to bring the today's presentation to a close and wish you all a very good day. Thank you so much once again.